Greetings, greetings, greetings. Greetings. Oh, I tell you what, get your pen and paper ready. We've got some good thoughts, some good discussion here that's coming. We're talking about the boy Jesus here. We're representing the best class on the planet, the shepherd's class yes. at shepherd's Ebenezer class. Baptist Church, the yes. shepherd's class. Yes. And this is my beautiful bride of 31 years, Sister Shelbonnie Hall. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes. And we... Did you introduce yourself? I didn't. Oh. I thought you were going to introduce okay, me. Okay, okay, I will. And this is my groom of 31 years, all right, all the right. Reverend Dr. Timothy all Gerald right, Hall Sr. All right, all right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This, this lesson, oh, it's so good. We're talking about the boy Jesus, and I just can't wait to get in. Let's pray right quick, and then... Sister Shabani, go ahead and jump in and just go ahead and get it started. But let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come now in Jesus' mighty, miraculous, magnificent name, Lord. And Father, we ask your word to go forth. Yes, we ask that what is said today, every one of us can put it into our daily lives yes. and lead better lives, more fulfilling lives, and we can learn. Yes, we Lord. Lean on your word, Father. We lean on you, and we thank you, Lord, for yes, all Lord. you're doing. We thank you for all you're going to do. In Jesus' Lord. mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. Take amen. it away, my bride. Okay. Take it away. I got it. Thank you. Uh, the lesson being presented today is titled, The Boy Jesus. Our printed text is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the first and seventh verses. And also the second chapter of Luke, verses 39 through 52. In this lesson, we explore the account of Jesus' experience in the temple at the age of 12 and the awe, experience, and amazement of all those who witness Jesus' wisdom and teaching. Mm -hmm. Finally, this lesson allows us a glimpse into the anguish of Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, when they noticed their son was not with them, mm -hmm. and their rejoicing and amazement when they found their son in the temple. This lesson begins with one of my favorite scriptures, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. It is believed that King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, is the author of this particular book of the Bible. It is said that he composed this book towards the end of his life. Solomon is reminding us that there are cycles of life. And for each cycle, we must be about doing the work of God. Verse 1 is part of the first uh, of eight verses that is referred to as the Time for Everything poem, where the verses compare opposite occurrences uh, and, you know, a time to be born and a time to die. Uh, but th that, and that there is a time for every activity. Notice in verse 1 what it does not say. Verse 1 does not say for some things okay. there is a season, All right. nor does it say uh, a time to some purpose. Verse 1 tells us that to everything, Amen. There is a season Amen. and a time to every purpose under the heaven. My mother-in-law, uh, Lily Beasley Hall, has always talked about the seasons of life. I recall her saying many years ago uh, that she was in the fall of her life. Uh, she referred to herself back then, those many years ago, as the middle-aged grandma. That's what she called her, herself, 
a middle-aged grandma. She now tells us that she is in the winter of her life. So I want each of us to remember that regardless of the season or cycle of our life, that God has a plan for all of us and we must continue to do God's work during all seasons for that is our purpose for being. Verse seven, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Solomon teaches us that timing is important and that sometimes it is appropriate for us to keep our mouth shut and other times it is better for us to speak. See, wisdom helps us to know the difference, realizing that God's timing is always perfect. Our duty as believers is to learn to appreciate and accept God's timing in all things, not some things, but as verse one stated, everything. And we have to do this because uh, there is a danger in resenting or doubting God's timing. God's timing with everything and anything is perfect. And this is sometimes uh, a hard pill to swallow. For instance, when you unexpectedly lose someone you love, you are preparing for one thing and God does something totally opposite of what you expected. Uh, this happened to me about a month or so ago uh, with my dad, my dear dad, uh, when he collapsed during his physical therapy session. Shocking is an understatement I mean, even his physical therapist, the nurse and doctor, they were all puzzled. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know one who was not. Amen. You see, God knew the day my daddy was born that that day on May 23rd, 2020, that my dad would return to him. It mattered not about my preparation for my dad to come and live with uh, Dr. Hall and myself. God required my dad's soul to be with him on that very day. Again, it is all about God's timing. And we as children of the Most High God, we must accept God's timing. Amen. It is all about trusting God in all things, not some, but all things. And verse 7 also refers to mourning. The ancient Jews would tear clothes. Uh, that is a time to rend. Rend means to tear. Mm -hmm. So they would tear clothes and be silent. And when the season of mourning was over, they would mend and speak. However, one could also read verse 7, as stated earlier, in having the wisdom in knowing when to hold on to our words and when to share them. Uh, we have to know whether it is wise to speak, and if so, when. Timing is important, because as we know, our voices can be used for both good and evil, and we know that there is life and death in the tongue, so timing is important. And uh, my handsome groom here okay, will right. now give the background what, what, of what's Luke. What's that you say? I what's said that? my handsome groom. Oh, he will give you. the background of Luke, <laughs> the second chapter, and he will, he will explore verses 39 okay. through 47. Okay. And I will review with you the remaining verses 48 through 52. Okay. Thank you so much, my beautiful bride. Thank you. Now... Solomon from the Ecclesiastes, he was, oh, the wisest man that, that ever he lived. Was. So we have to, every time we read Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, all that, we, mm -hmm. we just need to know, look, the wisest man 
is telling us this, so we need to take heed to it. Now, coming up behind him is Luke. Now, he was pretty smart himself now. He was, he's he's big-time doctor, All right. okay? So this Luke second chapter, Luke second chapter starts when Jesus was a baby. So he was obstetrician Luke then, right? But the whole Luke is, remember, remember our title now was talking about the boy Jesus. So right. this Luke, the whole chapter of the second chapter of Luke, okay, the second chapter of Luke takes Jesus from a boy, a baby boy, to a boy of 12. So we picking up here at the 39th verse, so I would encourage everyone, go back to the first verse and read it up so, so you can just see what's going on. But the 39th verse has us, and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And when I read this, I said, when, and when they had performed, every time a scripture starts with and or but or therefore, you got to back up and see, okay, what, what are they talking about? So we know the whole chapter was the birth of Jesus on up. And this, Jesus is still a baby here in verse 39. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, what things were those? They came. They had Jesus circumcised. They had him blessed in, in the temple. And they, after they had performed all that, according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. So he was a baby there, and Mary and Joseph took him on back home. Verse 40, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So now this is pediatrician Luke now. Pediatrician Luke is saying, okay, he's not a baby anymore. He's growing up. And, and he's growing up healthy, and he's growing up strong. Oh, I like these wellness checks with, with, with Jesus. And ooh, ooh, he's strong in the spirit, too. He's filled with wisdom. This mm -hmm. is an unusual child here. Mm -hmm. And not only was he strong, filled with the spirit and wisdom, he said the grace of God was upon him. Wow. Wow. I know every parent wants their child to grow up strong, filled with wisdom, yeah. and the grace of God to be upon him. Absolutely. So we'll talk about some things just Amen. a little later on as we get into the in focus on how do you ensure that your child is growing up strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God upon them. Verse 41, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Okay, so every year Jesus is going to, that. They're, they're bringing him along to the feast of the Passover. Uh, that's a, a week-long feast, and they're commemorating uh, where God has saved them. You know, they, they sacrificed the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and uh, the deaf angel passed over them. Uh, so every year they're just so thankful that they go back for this, for this feast. Okay, so they went back every year. Now 42 says, and when he was 12 years old, so they've been doing this 12 years. Every year they went, they first took him when he was a baby, and so that now he's back year after year after year. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So they went back for the feast of the Passover. And this was a special time, too, because boys there, when they get 12, then their, their rites of passage, if you will, when they went into manhood then, was at 13. So this was a, a special time uh, for, for Jesus. So when he was 12, verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast, and 43... And when they had fulfilled the days, that's that week-long 
feast of the Passover, when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. It's interesting, the scripture uh, says Joseph and his mother, not Jesus' parents here. It's differentiating now that, yes, Joseph was his earthly father, but his heavenly father. So they, his earthly father, Joseph and Mary, they're going on back home. Okay, 44 tells us how far did they travel. They said, but they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. Okay, a day's journey back then, they were walking, maybe had a few donkeys or so, <laughs> and just the whole caravan they had. Mama and them, daddy and them, uncle and them, you know, they had the whole family. They, they, because back then now, you better travel with your family, you better travel with your kinfolk because it was dangerous back then. You know, you had people that, you know, robbers, thieves, that if you were alone, it was just dangerous. So you would always travel in a company of folk. In a day's journey, walking, in a crowd like that, they traveled about 23 miles. And when they stopped to pitch their tents and camp that night, Mary and Joseph were looking for them. I can imagine Mary asking Joseph, is Jesus with you? And Joseph telling Mary, I thought he was with you. It's like, where is our child? So they searched for him. They searched for him. 43 says, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. They're like, oh, no, he, he's not with uncle and them. He ain't with aunt and them. Oh, We're we, we going back. So it's what, another day's journey back, right. 23, 23 miles back. 46, and it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. They searching all over the town for him. Three days, they can't find him. Then they go into the temple, and there he is. He's sitting amongst all the learned men. It says the doctors, you know, the Reverend Doctor this, the Reverend Doctor that, the Reverend Doctor this, all the professors, all the instructors, all the students of the Bible, Jesus is right there in the midst of them. He says, uh, Scripture 46 says, both hearing them and asking them questions. So Jesus is there, and he's listening to them, and then he's asking them questions he wants to better understand. This Jesus, boy Jesus, 12 years old, mm -hmm. right. he's hearing them, all oh, these guys who have been studying for years and years. And Jesus is in there holding his own. 47, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So not mm -hmm. only is Jesus hearing them, asking them questions, he's asking the doctors questions too. Yeah. Yeah. And he and the and he's the doctors then said, oh this guy is smart. What oh this guy is so learned. Right. Let's see if he knows the answer to this. We've been trying to figure this out and Jesus is firing back the answers. It said and answers. All that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So here's Jesus right in the midst, holding his own at 12 years old. Go ahead, my bride. Take us to the take us to the end. At All right. 48. Okay. Thank you for exploring those scriptures. Uh, 
given us all the uh, meaning and, 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 and the details and the background. Um, so that is always important. So thank you, the Reverend Doctor oh. Timothy Hall. Study the word. Study the word. I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that to that statement at the end. Finish okay. up here. Okay. With All right. Okay. 52. All right. All right. So now we're at verse 48. So we know that uh, Mary and Joseph. Uh, Jesus' earthly parents, they are now at the temple. And when they saw him, when his parents saw him, they were amazed at what they saw. Uh, they both knew since conception that their son Jesus mm -hmm. was special. Yep. And they had seen glimpses of uh, the favor of God being upon him. But here he was, 12 years old, a 12-year-old boy, perfectly comfortable and unperturbed with all of these doctors, learned men, highly educated men. Their son was holding his own. And however amazed or not, Mary was still a mother. So she got over being amazed right. and got into full-blown mama mode, <laughs> asking Jesus, son, why in the world would you do this? You have had your dad and I anxiously looking for you. We've been searching for you, frantic. Mary was expressing how concerned that she and Joseph were as parents. Right. You see, Mary had been entrusted with this God-given child, and she feared that she had lost him. So we can only imagine her frustration and her being anxious. And uh, a quick story, I recall being on a mother's trip with two of my children, Leland and Shelby Rose. We were at Disney World, and Shelby Rose was about eight or nine, which means Leland would have been about 13 or 14. Uh, and Shelby wanted to ride on some of the big rides with him, and she didn't want to be with me because, of course, I was taking her on the little children's ride because I have this thing about getting on big rides. I can't do the, 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 the big rides, all the, the, I don't even know the name of, the roller coasters and all of those big rides. Anything that moves and shakes, I can't do it because I get, I get sick. So I had Shelby Rose on the little, the merry-go-round and some other things. Well, she got tired of that. So she wanted to be with her brother because they were getting on the big rise. Um, so, uh, so she asked if she could go with Leland. And so I told her, I said, yes. And I went to Leland and I said, okay, Leland, uh, you have Shelby Rose and make sure, the last thing I said to him, make sure you keep up with your sister, okay? So fast forward, when it was time for us to meet back at the bus, Leland appears with his friends without Shelby Rose, without his sister. So I immediately asked Leland, I said, where is Shelby? Uh, and Leland says, oh, oh, Shelby's with one of the other mothers. Uh, Leland said she couldn't keep up with us. So I asked one of the other mothers uh, if Shelby could stay with her and her boys. Okay, so when the other mother comes to the bus with her boys, Shelby Rose is not with her either. So I'm like Mary now. I'm anxious about now. I am inquiring of this mother, where is my child? This mother said to me, she says to me, when I took my boys to the restroom, I told Shelby to wait outside of the restroom. And when I came back, she was gone. What? By this time, I'm racing back to the park, which is almost closing time, frantically searching for my child. And the same mother had the audacity to tell me, don't panic. Stay calm. And I'm thinking, woman, do you not know I'm going to have to answer 
to Shelby Rose's <laughs> earthly father, I can't go back home <laughs> without his baby girl. Needless to say, thank God we found her. She had been spotted by some of the older teen girls who were also with us on the trip. And, uh, and thank God they saw her, they got her, and they kept Shelby Rose with them. So as a mother, I understand being frantic about the possibility of having lost your child and rejoicing when you find that child and, and, and getting over that and being upset and asking, what in the world were you thinking? Uh, so, you know, they had me deeply distressed and sorry. So, you know, Leland and Shepard Rose both had a whole lot uh, to meet with me about a little bit later about this whole thing of stressing me out about Shelby Rose and where she was. Uh, but getting back to the verse, I also suspect that with Mary, she was realizing like we all do at one time or you know another, when we realize our babies, our boys and girls, that they're growing up and the difficulty in allowing them to become uh, a young woman or a young man. And with marriage, she has a son who is also the Messiah, the savior of the world. Amen. Mary was looking for her boy, but what she found in the temple was a young man who was astounding the religious leaders with his questions and his answer. So this was likely a bittersweet moment for Mary as a mother, as was stated in Ecclesiastes chapter three, uh, verse one, there is a time to every purpose under the heaven. And this was a time for Mary and Joseph as parents to step back and let go, even when it tugged their heart, when it tugged on their heart to do that. Um, so in, 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 and in verse 49, Jesus says to his parents, how is it that you sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business. So Jesus responds to his mother's question, appears to admonish his parents that they should have known he would be somewhere doing the work of his heavenly father. Jesus answers his mother by asking uh, his parents two questions. Number one, how is it that you all are searching for me? <laughs> Jesus is saying, clearly, I'm not lost. No need to search for something or someone that's not lost. Number two, did you know that I must be about my father's business? That was his second question. So this is the first mention of Jesus, his realization that he was God's son. See, Jesus was not referring to his earthly father's business. Jesus is saying, I am the son of God, and I must now be about taking care of the business my heavenly father has sent me here to do. So Jesus was, was making his parents aware uh, of the importance of his heavenly father's business. Let me ask these questions and ask this of you. Are you doing the work of our Heavenly Father? Do you tell people in either words or deeds that you are about our Father's business? Do you feel compelled to do the work assigned to you by God? And is every other thing in your life or every other thing you do less significant than being committed to God? See, Jesus came from heaven to earth to fulfill God's work here on earth. And remember, God has each of us here on earth to fulfill a God-given purpose. Amen. And verse 50, it tells us that Mary and Joseph did not understand what Jesus was saying when he spoke to them. They didn't understand what he meant 
about his father's business, they didn't realize he was making a distinction between his earthly father and his heavenly father. However, Jesus knew he had a unique relationship with God. And both Mary and Joseph knew that their son, their baby boy, their baby boy was God's son. And while they knew all of this, yet they could not have fathom what their son, Jesus' mission, would involve. Can you imagine? Here they are trying to raise our Savior along with his other brothers and sisters. Mary and Joseph trying to raise Jesus as normal as possible. Yet, they had this child who was God, God in human form. So, so these chosen parents knew their child Jesus was unique, that he was indeed different. And I am certain that these earthly parents could never fully understand their child, for none of us are able to fully comprehend God. Scripture reminds us that God's ways are not our ways, and we will never understand or know how God flung the stars in the sky Amen. and how he created the sun and moon and the universe. Amen. Our mind could never comprehend such wonders. So it was not humanly possible for these earthly parents to fully understand their son. But what they did know, as is stated in verse 51, Jesus, you are coming back with us to Nazareth, and you will abide with us and by our rules while you're with us. How many of us have heard that before? <laughs> oh, now, I'm sure we were all perfect angels when we were growing up, right? And our parents never had to have that conversation with us. <laughs> now, Jesus was obedient. Jesus submitted. He was subjected. He, he, he subjected himself uh, to the authority and protection of his parents. He never rejected his earthly parents. In fact, Jesus went back to Nazareth with his parents, and he lived under their authority for another 18 years. So you know, uh, if the Son of God obeyed his human parents, there should never, never, ever be a reason none whatsoever for any of us to be disobedient to our parents. Amen. Now, you know, Jesus was 12, and it says that he stayed another 18 years with his parents. If I do the math right, that's about, what, 30? Okay. Now, we're not asking our children, are we? that they need to live on our roof until they're 30. No, we're not asking that. We're not asking that. What we're saying is that Jesus honored his mother and father just as we are all commanded to do. We can't use work or something else to justify neglecting our parents or our family. God wants us to take care of our family responsibilities and verse 51 also states that Jesus' mother, Mary, she kept all that Jesus said in her heart. So Mary collected every saying of Jesus, and she stored them in her heart. She didn't forget what Jesus said. So let us not forget what Jesus uh, said and what he tells us uh, in the word. Uh, so let us store them in our heart as well. Amen. And verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We know that Jesus was the oldest in a large family. And being the oldest, I would uh, surmise that Jesus likely had to help his dad, Joseph, provide for the family. As Jesus grew up, the scripture tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom. So Jesus' spiritual, spiritual uh, development increased, and he grew in the Holy Spirit. As we grow, 
we need to make sure we are developing spiritually. Amen. And we grow by reading and studying God, God's word. The scripture also said Jesus increased in stature. This signifies age, maturity in years or size. So we know Jesus also grew physically. This is the human aspect. Jesus grew as a human being and the divine aspect of him also increased. This tells us as believers that we are to develop fully in each of these key areas, physically, mentally, and spiritually. If it was important for Jesus' growth, it ought to be important for us and to us. Our life should be balanced. Mm -hmm. And verse 52 also tells us that Jesus increased in favor. Mm -hmm. Jesus had the grace of God upon his life. Jesus had divine influence and blessings upon his life. We know that having the favor of God will allow us to continuously attract and reap benefits, gifts and pleasure from God and people. This is what it means to have the favor of God upon our lives. We should all pray for God's favor on our life. Amen. Amen. I just, I just want to add two things to that. Uh, the first is Psalms 32, 8. And you mentioned your mother-in-law, Lily Beasley Hall. And she, this is one of her favorite scriptures. Um, that Lily Pandora Beasley Hall, I don't you gotta throw that Pandora in there. <laughs> but it's oh, 32 eight is, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye, but personalize it, personalize right. it. So I'm gonna personalize it uh, for me. It says, I will instruct Tim and teach Tim in the, very, in the way which Tim shall go I will guide Tim with mine eye. So as we're reading these scriptures, personalize it mm -hmm. because they couldn't make a Bible and where they put the in there, they, they say, okay, this is the Tim Bible. You know how you go and you see your keychain with your name on it? They couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't make a lot of Bibles like that. Right. So personalize it. And Jesus gives us the example uh, I, I want to go back to, you were saying, the reverend doctor. You don't have to be a reverend doctor to study the word. You don't have to be a reverend doctor to, to understand the word. You don't have to be a reverend doctor to get wisdom from the word. You, you, you've got to ask the Lord for wisdom. Ask the Lord as I'm reading this. Holy Spirit, help me understand this. And God says that he will give it to us he liberally. Will. He will give it to us. Yeah. Now, I'd like to close with the in-focus scripture. The in-focus um, passage uh, today was, was so very good. Uh, talking about a girl who's very smart, and it's so fitting because we just talked about Jesus who was just so very smart but this child was 16 years old she had uh, graduated high school she was going off to college and uh, she went to the college of her dreams I don't I don't know what the college of your dreams are is it the great Tuskegee University no it had to have been Florida <laughs> Agriculture and Mechanical University the one who sits on the highest hill well, in Tallahassee Florida highest anywho, of 70 years in Tallahassee excuse, Florida excuse excuse me though. okay I'm sorry anywho she got to her favorite college and when she finished she 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 had did a double major there in engineering and marketing, and then she started her own business and all, and her parents came to see her. And her, her father said, I don't understand all that you do, 
uh, but I'm always glad to support you in whatever. And your mother and I are so very excited for you. Mm -hmm. And the girl said, thanks. She's very happy that they prayed for her and supported her. And she thanked God for being with her and listening to her. And the parents said, God is always listening, and the parents are too. So parents, this lesson on the boy Jesus, this lesson to us about our children, we need to continuously pray for them. Amen. Continuously support them. Amen. We need to continuously study the word. We need to continuously look at the example of Jesus and put it into our lives. Yes. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come now just thanking you, Lord, Thank for you, Lord. just this lesson. Yes, Lord. Thanking you for just the study, the discussion. Yes, thanking yes. you for Thank the you. insight. Thanking you, Lord, for everyone watching this that can yes, take God. something out of this and put into their daily lives yes, and be better people. Yes, God. We thank you, Lord, for your son. We yes, thank you, Father, yes, for everything you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for everything you're going to do. Yes, All this in Jesus' mighty, magnificent name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.